Good evening, good evening. Amen. All right, all right. Wait for a few of our leaders to jump on. Thank God for all of those who are going to tune in on today. Come on in the room, as they say. Come on in the room. We'll be getting started in approximately three to four minutes. We're a little bit behind time, but we are good. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. We just thank God for another day and it's allowing us to, to fellowship in his word one more time. Um, it is a blessing um, whenever we have an opportunity to fellowship um, in the word of the Lord, fellowship together and study of the word. So it is a blessing and I thank God for the opportunity to come before you teaching on tonight. Um, it is a blessing. We thank God. Amen. We're getting just started in a few minutes, waiting for some of our leaders to jump on and those who, um, that are on Facebook. Amen. 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 As you come in the room, go ahead and give some hearts, some likes. Let me know you're here. Amen. If you're in the room, let us know that you are here. Give some likes, some hearts. Hit share on tonight. Just in a few minutes, give some more people some time to jump on. A little bit behind today, but we'll be getting started shortly. Amen. Let me know you're here. Give some hearts, give some likes. Amen. Bless you. Bless you, Dad Larry. Bless you. Amen. Amen. We'll be getting just started in a few more minutes. Like I said, I'm running a little bit behind. I had to do a, some a setup here. So um, good teaching on tonight as we continue the teaching about faith. Amen. Try to give it a few more minutes. Amen. We will be in chapter 10 on today. We started it a little bit last week. We're going to jump back into it on today. For those um, that may be watching from the Standard Gap Ministry page, if you don't have a book, um, amen, amen. God bless you, Sister um, Brenda. God bless you. We are in chapter 10 tonight, chapter 10 tonight. Amen. We are in chapter 10. 
on tonight. I'm going to open up with prayer. Thank God for some of our leaders. I know you're on two different um, links, and that is fine. That's the reason why I have it up, to make it as easy as possible for you to find our Bible study on tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness to God, as always, and your faithfulness to the ministry. And so I'm just going to open up with prayer on tonight. We're going to jump right in. Whoever jumps on from here um, will we'll catch on to the, the teaching. Father in heaven, um, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, how you've been protecting us and taking care of us, Lord God, and watching over us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness, Lord God, and this virus, this coronavirus that's been going around. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for keeping us healthy and strong, Lord God, and not allowing this virus to affect us in any kind of way, Father God. But we yet send prayers, Lord God. We yet been interceding, Lord God, for those um, that have been infected by this virus, Father God, whether they're in a prison, whether they're in a nursing home, whether they're in another country, whether they're around the corner from us, Father God, whether they're in another state or city, Father God, uh, we yet been interceding on their behalf, Father God, praying, Lord God, that you touch and heal their bodies, Lord God. Don't allow this virus, Father God, to take out anybody else, Father God. We, this virus is has taken out quite a few people, Father God, but we are just praying right now, Father God, that you lift this virus up, Father God, that you remove this virus, Father God. Uh, we know that your will has to be done, Father God. We understand the scriptures have to be fulfilled, Father God, and we don't want to pray against your will, Lord God, or against your word, Father God, because we understand that things have to be fulfilled, things have to come to pass, Father God, but we're just praying, Lord God, that you just continue to have mercy upon us, Father God, that you just allow this virus, Lord God, to lift, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for you said the prayers of the righteous man availeth much, Father God. And you said men shall always pray and to faint not, Father God. And so even in these last hours, Father God, help us not to faint. Help us not to give up, Father God. Help us to trust and count on you, Father God. We just pray right now, Father God, that I, I'm just speaking it into existence, Father God. As Apostle Jesse said, this is a corporate anointing, Father God. It's time for us as the body to come together, Lord God, and continue to pray and intercede, Father God. You have given us power and authority in your name, Father God. And Father God, and that we're able to pray, Lord God, and break strongholds, Lord God, and, and cast out demons, Father God, and sickness, Lord God, people will be healed, Father God, because of the power and authority, Lord God, that you have given us. And I'm praying right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you raise up a people, Lord God, that didn't believe in you, Father God, didn't trust in your word, Father. You begin to raise them up in this season, Lord God, that they may be a help to the kingdom, Father God, as us seasoned saints, Father God, has been praying and interceding, Lord God. We're praying, Lord God, that you raise up a remnant, an extra remnant, Lord God, to, to join in with us, Lord God, as we intercede on, on the behalf of those who are lost, even those who don't believe and they're infected by the virus, Father God, praying that you touch right now, Father God. But Father God, we pray that you bless this teaching on tonight. We believe you. We believe in your word, Father God, and we pray that your word will work mightily, Lord God, or continue to work mightily in our lives, Father God. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. On tonight, we are in chapter 10. And we've been dealing with the nature of faith. Um, what I wanted to open up with, and, and, and I put it on Facebook, sometimes I throw some little nuggets out there or some things that the Lord has put in my spirit. I want you to know on tonight, even though we're dealing with the nature of faith, um, that faith sees, faith hears, faith speaks. Faith can see, faith hear, and faith can speak. And I, and I wanted to open up like this because of the simple fact that we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. So faith can see, okay? And faith can see much further than we can see naturally. And so I want to encourage you because as born-again believers, as the Bible says, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So faith can see beyond what we can see. Faith can see us being victorious in whatever the circumstance or whatever the situation is. Faith already sees you um, conquering whatever this situation is. Faith already sees us coming out of this, this season that we're experiencing this coronavirus. Faith already sees us being more than conquerors. Faith already sees us healed. Faith already sees us past this season. See, right now, because we're dealing with this coronavirus and we're praying and we're interceding for people, it seemed to be um, a rough time because people are, are, are dying uh, daily. Um, I'm also seeing um, a video was shared last night. I shared it on one of my pages 
um, of, of the prison that I am. I'm a volunteer chaplain at. Um, guys are just, they're just dying. And, and, and the guy did a video um, from his cell phone and he was just showing some of the guys that's on the compound in his room or in his dormitory. Um, they were sick and, and from this virus and they don't get all the medical attention or maybe all the medical help. And he, and he also showed a picture of uh, of where the guys that had already died, he had showed them where they were just, just putting them. And it broke my heart. I told my wife this morning, it broke my heart to, 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 to see this, um, to see this, this men that are not able to get the help that they need. And I'm just praying that, you know, that these people that have passed, I'm praying that they have faith in God. I'm praying that they were believers because to, to die and, 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 because of this virus and not to be in Christ, it, it, it's a bad situation. And I know we don't like to talk like that because we just think everything has have to be so glamorous. Everything got to be all heaven, uh, everybody going to heaven. And that's just not the case. And it, it saddens me to see so many guys just suffering on that, on that prison compound um, from that virus. And so we, we as believers, we have power and authority that we have not even tapped into. And that's why I said faith sees, you know, faith sees these individuals being healed. They may not can see it because of they're actually experiencing the virus, but faith sees, faith sees this individual or these individuals that are infected. They see that they are healed. Faith hears, faith cometh by hearing, hearing what the word of God. So faith hears, faith sees. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit, because when 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 faith speaks, because faith does have a voice, when faith speaks, our spirit quit, automatically identifies with what faith is saying. OK, our faith is in the word of God. And so when somebody begins to speak by faith, instantly our spirit can can bear witness of what they're speaking. OK, and so that could be something I, I should add in there. Faith sees, faith hears. Faith, oh yes, faith speaks. Faith has a language. Faith has a voice, okay? Um, the Bible says without faith is impossible to please God. And so we have to learn how to speak the faith language, okay? Learning the, the voice of faith. And, and how else can we do that but the word of God? The word of God is, is what we speak, it is the faith language, is what we speak by faith. So just, get to, just getting this in your spirit because as we get into this study on tonight, um, you, this may, um, through the course of our study, you may see that faith does see, faith hears, faith comes by hearing. The more that you hear the word of God, God bless you, Minister Baker. Um, the more that you hear the word of God, it builds your faith. Okay. So all of this is important. You need to get this in your spirit. Faith can see beyond what you can see. Faith hears. Okay. Because I, I put it on Facebook, um, that, I can hear something, but I can see something different. Somebody can say, man, this, this, this brother right here, man, he's sick. But faith tells me that they're healed. Because there are scriptures, the Bible talks about he bore our sicknesses and our diseases. Um, so, so faith tells me, even though I hear that this person has been infected with the virus or they're sick or they have cancer or whatever the case is, I hear this. But faith allows me to see that they're healed. Faith does not allow me to process the fact that what I'm hearing. Faith allow what happens is when I, when I hear the things that I'm hearing, the word of God kicks in and says, what does your word say based upon what I'm hearing? So this is how you need to process things. That when you hear something that does not maybe sound like faith, what you have to do is tap into faith and say, Lord, what does your word say? This is what they said. But I don't see what I'm not I'm not seeing what they said because your word speaks totally different than what I've been hearing. OK. And so I'm just want to get this in your spirit, because through the course of the day, through the course of a week, we will experience so many different um, challenges. OK, so many different things that we will experience. And sometimes um, we get overwhelmed with the situation. Sometimes we get frustrated with the situation. But we cannot lose hope. We cannot lose faith in God. And so that's what our lesson is about today. We talked about faith and the distinction between faith and, and hope. 
faith and hope. There is a distinction. Um, faith is present. Okay. How do we know this? Because the scripture says in Hebrews 11 and 1, now faith. Now means presently. Okay. Now presently faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope for. Hope for is an expectancy. Hope for is futuristic things. Our hope is in that our Savior comes back for us. Okay. By faith, we believe, but our hope is in that he comes back. So my hope is, in, is a futuristic expectation. Okay. And faith, watch this, allows me to see that what I'm hoping for it will happen. I told you faith sees. Faith sees my eternal future. Faith tells me if I hold on to what the word of God says, I am going, what I'm hoping for, I'm going to obtain. What is our, 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 our hope is that not only do we see Christ, our hope is that we get to heaven. So faith is telling me, faith allows me to see what I'm hoping for. The only way I can see what I'm hoping for is by faith. That's why it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in other words, without faith, it's impossible for me to see what I'm hoping for. Okay, you will not see what God is trying to show you unless you walk by faith, unless you learn the faith language. The faith language is the word of God. You have to learn how to speak the word of God over your situation um, and whatever you're experiencing. As you know, and I didn't open up with it, this is uh, we are in the Passover season, Passover season. And the, the reason why I, I, the Lord had put in my spirit to, to minister from memory transfer, which I've been talking about for a little bit now, is because this is not the only time that we should be um, remembering our Savior, remembering him as a sacrificial lamb. I brought a lot of this stuff out um, through the book of Exodus and how he was the sacrificial lamb, how he was the unleavened bread. Uh, even in the 13th chapter, it talks about how... Um, the, the, the firstborn males were dedicated in the firstborn of the womb and the firstborn of the, uh, of, of the beast were dedicated back to God. This was something that God was implementing. You see this in Exodus, the 13th chapter. Um, take your time. If you can find some time, read it. Um, you see that these things were dedicated to God um, as they entered into their new land, the land that was promised to them, that was flowing with milk and honey. But you also find uh, and, and to, to support this scripture uh, of the, the firstborn of the womb, you also see that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Where did we find that out? That's in first, not first, that is uh, Colossians, the first chapter, verse 15, where it says that Jesus was in the image of God and also the firstborn of God. Okay, and then if you read John, the first chapter, it tells you that the word was in the beginning and the beginning was the word and word and so on and so forth. So Jesus being the firstborn of God was also in the beginning of God. And then also the verse 16 goes on to say that the word, the firstborn um, or, or the word, which is Jesus had everything that he created visible and invisible. Okay, and so we have to believe that by faith that everything that we see around us was created by our Savior because he's the word that when God spoke the word, he's Jesus being the word that things manifest, things were created um, when the word was spoken. OK, so there is a differential or a distinction between faith and hope um, here on page 84. If you have your books open, page 84, um, just want to go through these things that we open up with on last week. Um, we, we already dealt with hope is futuristic things. Faith is present. Okay. Um, they, they, they even, uh, let me read the, under distinguished from hope. Uh, let, I'll read that paragraph, uh, page 84. Um, it says, this, this important verse brings out various facts about faith. The verse I was just talking about, Hebrews 11 and 1. First of all, it indicates a distinction between faith and hope. There are two main ways in which faith differs from hope. The first is that hope is directed towards the future, as I said, but faith is established in the present. Hope is an attitude of expectancy concerning the things that are yet to, yet to be. But faith is the substance or the confidence of something real, de defiant or definite within us, okay, we, that we possess here and now. So faith is present. Faith is right now. Second, the main difference between faith and hope is that hope is anchored in the realm of the mind. 
So hope is anchored in the mind, okay? Whatever my expectations, however I'm processing what I'm hoping for, okay? It's in the mind. My hope uh, of what I'm looking for. Is, is anchored in the mind. Now, faith is anchored in the realm of the heart. Now, we talked about the heart and the mind Sunday, and I told you the, the alignment um, and how important that, um, that what we are processing here needs to be processed here, okay? And we're going to get into that tonight because I didn't even, realistically, I could be honest, I didn't even know that this was going to be hitting on some of the things I talked about Sunday about memory transfer. And what is here has to be transferred her, here in our heart, but it gets a little bit more in depth. Okay? So hope is in the realm of the mind. Faith is in the realm of the heart. Okay? Let's turn to page 85. Just doing a light review. Top 85 says this. Thus, hope is a mental attitude of expectation. So what happens is I am processing in my mind of what I'm hoping for. I heard it, but now I'm processing. What happens with our mind, sometimes with our mind, when somebody is saying something, it gives us an opportunity to see, or we can kind of get a, a visual picture of what's being said, okay? And so it's, it's a mental attitude of expectancy. If somebody says you're going to get a, a brand new red car, um, you're going to get you a, a brand new red Chevy Malibu. Instantly, okay, your mind pictures a red, it's a Malibu, it's brand new, okay? Instantly, your mind pictures this, and now there's an expectation or expectancy of, I heard that I was going to get a brand new car, and they said the color, they said the name, I'm seeing it here. Now I'm hoping what I'm seeing here, I will be able to I'll be able to get the keys in my hand. Okay? So it's an expectancy. All right. Faith is the condition of the heart. Producing within top of page 85, producing within us. Okay? That's the key. That's where we want the word. That's where we want the change to be. Not just here. And we're going to get into this because this is going to get good. Here in the bold print, it says, hope is an attitude of expectancy concerning the things that are yet to be, yet to come. But faith is a substance, a confidence, something real and definite within us that we possess here and now. Okay. Now, let's go to the second paragraph on page 85. All right. It says, many people, watch this. This is what we're going to get into just the whole mental process. Many people profess. Profess is dealing with declaration. Many people make a declaration of faith in Christ. Most times when you have a conversation with somebody, they would say, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Yep, I'm saved. Okay. They make this profession verbally. Okay. Faith in Christ. And they, and they also say, you know what? I believe in the Bible. I read the Bible. You know, I go to church. But their faith is only in the realm of the mind, okay? All right? So basically what they're saying is they're only professing what they have processed psychologically, okay? And it says it is an intellectual acceptance of certain facts and doctrines. So they're processing the word of God. And I talked about this. There's a lot of believers, excuse me, that have head knowledge, You'll run into even unbelievers. They have a lot of head knowledge. They have a lot of knowledge of the scripture, a lot of knowledge of God. And, and they will converse with you, and you would think this unbeliever saved because they're conversing with you. They know the scriptures. And you'd be like, man, how you know all this and you ain't no believer? Okay? Because what they have done is they have retained the information that they got. That's just like in school when we have to take a, a test. And maybe it's a memorization test. And we only memorize these words or we only memorize the definitions just so we can pass the test. But we never allow ourselves to memorize these words where they become a part of us. We only do it for that moment because if it, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm only studying these words so I can get an A on my test. 
but I'm not studying for these words to become a part of my life. I'm studying these words just so I can pass the test. You, you can see the difference, okay? And so what God is trying to say is through, through this teaching that just professing faith, just saying that you're a believer, just saying that you go to church and you, you're a Christian is just is not enough, okay? It's not enough, all right? If you have questions, um, if I'm going too fast, um, let me know. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, the more questions you ask, um, it could be a question somebody else wanted to ask, but it also um, brings out the Bible study as well. So please, don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay, so the acceptance of facts and doctrines. So they're processing facts and doctrine, okay? This is not true because scriptural faith, okay, just quoting scripture, just memorizing scripture, it does not pr produce a vital change, okay? It does not produce. Me just memorizing the stories of the Bible, um, memorizing certain scriptures, um, does not produce change. Change does not come in because I've retained it, okay? It's good that I retained it, but there is a change that's supposed to happen, okay? Watch this. Next paragraph says, on the other hand, heart faith, that means now what I have up here is now being processed in my heart. I'm now believing I'm now accepting what I processed here in my heart. So it's not just me psychologically memorizing scripture, but this scripture that I've memorized have now became a part of me. Okay? All right? Watch where we're going with this. Heart faith always produces a definite change. Okay? So when you allow the word of God, to transition or transfer from your mind to the point where you start believing what you're hearing and you're processing and it lines up with the word of God, that's when change comes, okay? Because we can quote scriptures all day, but then we don't live by the scripture. That's basically where we're getting to. So it's more than just quoting the scripture. We want the scripture now to become a part of us where we live out this actual scripture, Okay, there's a definite change in those who profess. Okay, so when you get this word in your heart, there's a definite change. All right, um, I continue to read. It says, when associated with the heart, the verb to believe. Okay, to believe, and you'll see it in, in, a, in a, par uh, a paragraph below, it deals with change in motion. Okay, so when you hear see the word believe, when everybody says they believe, there is an action that follows, okay? The moment that I believe there is an action or there is a motion that takes place, okay? We're going to get into this. Becomes a verb of motion. Hence, Paul says, with the heart one believes into righteousness, not merely unto righteousness, but into righteousness it is one thing to believe with the mind. There's one thing to uh, believe with the mind or a change of mind unto righteousness. Now, don't get um, caught up in the verbiage. When I say verbiage, some of the words, okay, because sometimes we can get so stuck with unto, into, that we lose sight on what God is saying here, okay? So with the mind, um, my mind is may, may be transformed in a sense. Here it is, believe with the mind unto righteousness. Now, we know because I've accepted Christ, I'm made righteous, okay? So my mind now processes righteous, okay? That means I'm in right standing, okay? And, and, and I'm just doing it from a psychological standpoint. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm made righteous. I am in right standing with God, okay? That's good that I process that. But watch this. It says, believe with the mind unto righteousness, merely as an abstract theory or idea, it is quite another thing to believe with the heart into righteousness. Okay? So in my heart now, I am processing, not just psychologically, what Jesus did, but now it becomes a part of me. Okay? That is to believe in a way that produces transformation. Because I believe in my heart that I am made righteous, 
I just don't just obtain it up here. But I believe in my heart, according to the scripture that says I am made righteous, he made me righteous. Now I am learning how to live out being in right standing with God. Okay? So it's just not me processing it psychologically. Okay? As I obtained this knowledge. One of the perfect examples of this, if I can use it, is the Pharisees. Pharisees will be a perfect example of this, the religious leaders. Because the religious leaders, they knew the word. They knew the law. They knew it. And if somebody went against the law, guess what? They knew how to quote that law based upon whatever, however somebody had broke it or, or offended the law, whatever the case may be. But guess what? They never allowed that law to change their hearts. That's why when Jesus came on the scene, they were bitter. They were jealous. Jesus said, I just came to fulfill the law. That's all I came to do. All right. But the Pharisees were all, they had it all head knowledge. If you was to have a conversation about the law, they can tell you this law forbade But they never allowed that law. They never allowed the word of God to change their hearts. And so they became bitter. They became jealous. Okay. So this teaching aligns itself with that because we're just not believing unto righteousness psychologically. We're also saying I'm believing in my heart too. Because when I believe the word of God that I've, that I've processed here in my heart, then I'm going to change. Okay. I give you, if the you know, Bible tells us, you know, that as believers, we shouldn't lie. Okay. Now, just to process that, well, you know, you know, in a conversation, man, the word of God says you ain't supposed to be lying. But then you have not allowed that word, that, that scripture to enter into your heart. So you lying just as much as the person that you caught lying. That's how the Pharisees was. Pharisees wasn't trying to, you know, they, they, they knew the law, but they, they knew it on the strength of how it worked for them. Okay, so I hope you're getting this. But the transformation is what I'm trying to get to. It's, it's the heart, okay? God wants to transform our heart. And he transforms our heart through the word of God. So it's just not us professing what we have obtained psychologically. Now it's processing what I obtained psychologically. And now I need to believe it in my heart, okay? All right, let's uh, drop down to the last paragraph. If you have any questions, please don't be afraid to ask. Page 85, last paragraph. It says, this brings out the fact that the verb phrase to believe is associated with the process of change or motion. It is not enough to believe in Christ with mere mental acceptance of the fact of his life or truth of his teaching. Okay, so just processing it psychologically is not enough. We must believe into or in Christ. We must believe in Christ. Let me say it that way so you don't get confused with the end two. We must believe in Christ. We must move by a heartfelt faith. We're dealing with this heart faith, believing in our heart, out of ourselves. Okay? So I'm, I'm believing, I'm moving by faith, but I'm not moving by faith in myself. I'm moving by faith in Christ and out of sin and into righteousness. So I'm moving out of self. Okay? I'm moving out of sin and I'm moving in Christ and I'm moving in righteousness. I'm moving from weakness because my flesh is weak. Scripture says this, but the spirit is willing into power. My power comes through Christ. My power and authority comes through Christ. So I'm, 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 remove, I'm moving from the weakness of me, the flesh, into the power in the power of God out of failure because before I came to Christ, I was a failure. But now that I'm in Christ, we, we dealt with Jesus and his triumphal entry. He is triumphal. You are triumphal. You are victorious. Page 86. Out of limitations. As, as a human being, we are limited into um, omnipo... Um, uh, um, messed the word. Forgive me. Um, but from our limitations to knowing that God has all power. He's all knowing. Okay. I got tongue tied. Forgive me. Um, the scripture, the scriptural faith of the heart always produces change. Listen to that again. The scriptural faith, when I process the word of God by faith in my heart, 
it's going to produce change. It's always believing in Christ in righteousness. <laughs> and the results is always something definite, experience here and now, not merely a hope for the future. So remember, faith is present. Faith is now. Next paragraph says, for this reason, John 6 and 47, Christ uses the present and, and not the future tense. He says, he who believes has everlasting life. So you see the, the, the verbiage or, or, or the wording is he who believes has, has his present eternal life. That, excuse me. That means you have it at the moment that you confess and believe. Okay? So when we deal with, when you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you're confessing what you have knowledge of. Okay? You went to Sunday school and they, and they told you this is what you got to do to be saved. So you processed it here. You confess what you processed here, but now what I, what I professed, I have to believe. Okay? It sounds redundant and repetitive, but we got to get to seeing your spirit. Okay. Um, let's drop down one, two. The third paragraph says, so many have a, a religion that they hope will somehow, we're on page 86, um, third paragraph. So many have a religion that they hope will somehow do them good when they reach the threshold of eternity. But true Bible faith gives the believer a here and now experience and an assurance of everlasting life already with him. So that means the minute that I believe by faith, okay, the minute that I truly believe by faith, spiritually, the Bible says, I am seated in heavenly places. Okay? Spiritually, I am seated in heavenly places. The minute that I truly believe, the minute that I truly believe I'm a king and a priest, or you're a queen and a priest, the minute that you believe, that's why I said, your name is changed. You know, people say, you know, sinner saved by grace. That's not even the doctrine. Yet you were a sinner, but now that I've accepted Christ, I am a son or a daughter. You heard me say that before. Okay. All right. And if no questions, we're going to still be on page 86. Um, we're under the, the title based solely on God's word. As we know, this is what our whole teaching has been about this book, that Christ is our foundation. And we're going to build upon this foundation, the word of God. Okay. The word of God is what we build upon our foundation. Our foundation is Christ, but what we build upon Christ is the word of God. Okay. So we have to build a solid foundation. All right. We can't build a man-made foundation. Okay. Because what happens is, um, oops, sorry about that. What happens is we accept Christ. Christ is our foundation. But then we take on man's doctrine and what man says and what man believes. We can't get caught up like that because then what happens is our foundation is no longer secure. Okay? The minute that Christ is my foundation, we're not saying you're not saved, but how you build upon that foundation is important. Okay? And if you're not building your foundation on the word of God, you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And so that's why we're doing this, so we can make sure that we build upon our foundation the right way. So our next topic is based solely on God's word. Watch this. It says, let us turn back now to the definition of faith given in Hebrews 11 and 1. And note one other important fact about faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen or a sure conviction concerning things not seen. This shows that faith deals with things not seen, okay? So faith is actually dealing with things, as it says, that is not seen, okay? We have never seen God at any time. Now, we see God because of things around us, but we never seen God. We didn't walk with Jesus, but by faith, we know that he exists, okay? Okay? So it says, watch this, faith is not based on the evidence of our physical senses, okay? So we can't attach faith to, here we go, we're not walking by sight, we're walking by faith. So what happens is faith is not something that I see, all right? 
Faith is not something that I see. That's why the scripture says that. Let me read it again. Faith is not based upon the evidence of, of our physical senses, but on the eternal, the invisible truth. Okay? Then God is the invisible truth. All right? And reality is revealed by God's word. All right? So, one of the, I think the analogies that they, they, they talked about, and, and I, I'll bring it up in there if, yeah, it's on page 87. It deals with um, sickness and healing. Okay? So, and, and I, I've used this analogy. Sometimes we, we're in the season where, um, yeah, we have this virus, but we're in a season where either our allergies to start kicking up or whatever the case is, runny nose, sore throat, scratchy throat, whatever the case may be. Um, so you could be sick physically, but the scripture says himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So faith, once again, as I opened up, you hear one thing or you feel one thing in your body, but God's word tells us something totally different, even though you feel a certain thing. So when I'm understanding this, that I may be sick, but by faith, I am healed. So when I allow that scripture or this scripture here, that's in Matthew 8 and 17, himself, he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Jesus, when he was on a cross, he bore our sicknesses. He took upon our sicknesses and our diseases and stuff that we will experience. So even though I'm infected with a disease or a sickness, he took that, he, he bare that on the cross. So in other words, even though I'm experiencing in my body, okay, what God is saying by faith, I am healed. Now, to process this mentally, you won't experience your healing because you will say, well, I'm, I'm experiencing sickness, but I know the word of God says this. And you just quoted the scripture, but you're not believing the scripture. See, our healing and our deliverance and our breakthrough comes when we start believing the scripture. Okay? And walking out the scripture. That means even if you got to take medicine, Father God, I'm praying over this medicine, even as I take it, that you can work through this medicine because your body, because the word of God says this. Okay, that's faith because you got the symptoms of your sickness. But faith is saying that you're healed. Faith is saying that you, you're going to be delivered. Faith is saying you're going to come out on the winning end. Okay, so we can't look at natural stuff. Okay, faith reveals to us um, the invisible truth realities revealed by God's word. Paul brings out this contrast between the objects of faith and the objects of sense perception when he says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith here contrasts with sight. Sight, along with the other physical senses, is related to the object of the physical world. Okay? Faith is related to the truth revealed in God's word. Faith is connected to the truth in God's word. That's why I told you, when somebody says, okay, such and such is going through, man, I don't know if they're going to make it. But you know instantly, by faith, you know the scripture says, you know, we're more than conquerors. So that scripture may come to your mind. But because you not only processed it here, you believe it here, then that scripture, according to the context, it works for you. You'll see that you're more than a conqueror. Now, that individual that's going through that you're hearing about Okay, may not be a conqueror at that moment, but you know, if you can introduce them to the one that helped you or, or the reason why you are more than a conqueror. Okay, How, we know plenty of people that's been going through different things. Okay, and God is saying now that you have the faith, now that you believe, listen, as the word of God has changed your life, excuse me. That same word that changed your life can change somebody else's life. But you got to believe first. That's the key. You have to believe first and walk out what you're believing. Okay? It says, faith is related to the truth revealed in God's word. Our senses deal with the things that are material, temporal, or changeable. Faith deals with the revealed truth of God, which are invisible, eternal, and unchanging. Okay? Two different contrasts here. 
our natural sight only deals with what we're hearing and what we're seeing. Faith sees beyond what we are hearing and what we're seeing. The invisible, okay? Faith sees beyond that. Faith looks beyond what you're going through. And faith looks beyond and says, no, I see you already coming out. It's almost like faith prophesies to you. It says, no, you're already coming out of this or you're going to come out of this. Okay. That's what faith, that, that's just how powerful faith is. The natural sense of us, whatever's before us seems to be so big. But when you believe in God's word and you get it in your heart, then the word of God will come forth and says, no, what's in front of me is not greater than God. Okay? Simple analogy, but we struggle with so much of things that we see, and they overwhelm us to the point where we never um, have faith in God or his word. So what we have to do is not allow our situations to overwhelm us, but to trust God and his word, because God is greater than your situation. God's word is greater than your situation. So knowing that these two entities, God and his word, is greater than your situation, then I can't allow myself to be overwhelmed when I know that God's word is going to conquer this. Okay? Last paragraph on page 86. It says, if we are carnally minded, to be carnal minded is death. There is no life in carnality. Okay, no life in being fleshy. Fle you fleshy is going to get you in more fleshy trouble, if I can say it that way. It says, we accept only the fact, only that which our senses reveal to us. So carnality or being carnal, you only accept natural or carnal things. Okay. If you're going to, if you're going to think carnal minded, carnal minded is just looking at things from a natural perspective, you're only going to process it naturally, okay? You're not going to process it by faith. You're going to process it, process it by your emotions. You're going to process it by how you feel. You're going to process it by how you understand it. Now, your understanding will be totally different than God's understanding. Your perspective will be totally different than God's perspective. So God is saying, listen, don't process it carnally, on how you process it. God says, no, process it how I see it. Okay? When you walk by faith, then what God declared comes to pass. You see it. Okay? But you have to walk by faith to actually witness or to actually experience the word of God um, coming to pass in your life. If you walk by faith. When you don't walk by faith, then what God declare, you don't experience um, the divine truth or what God is trying to show you when you don't believe, okay? So we don't want to be carnal minded. So this is, but if we are spiritually minded, page 86, second line, if we are spiritually minded, our faith makes the truth of God's word more real. When you walk by faith, you're proving that God's word is real. Because what happens is when you walk by faith, God's word begins to manifest right before you. The minute that you start walking by faith, the minute that you start believing God in his word, his word will begin to unfold and reveal himself through his word. But it only happens when you walk by faith. Okay. When you continue to walk by faith, you start seeing what God declared. You see it. You become. When you walk by faith, you become what God declared when you walk by faith. Everything that God declared over your life, when you walk by faith, it begins to manifest and come to pass. But it's only by faith. Okay? It says, but if we walk spiritually, if, if, but if we are spiritually minded, our faith makes, makes the truth of God's word more real than any anything that our senses may reveal to us, okay? We do not base our faith on what on that which we see or experience. We base our faith on God's word, okay? That's what we stand on is God's word. I'm not basing upon what I see because my perception could be blurry. 
my perception will keep me stuck. My perception will keep me in bondage. Okay? So that's why we can't trust what we see. We have to have faith in God and allow faith to kick in to help us to see from a different perspective. There's a God perspective that God wants us to, to look at our situations and look at our life through God's perspective, God's will, God's perspective of your life. Okay? God wants us to look in those lenses. Okay? He says, thereafter, that which we see or experience, bottom of page 86, therefore that which we see or experience is the outcome of that which we have already believed. Let's read that again. That which we see or experience is, is the outcome, that which we have already believed. In the spiritual experience, sight comes after faith, not before it. In spiritual experience, in a spiritual experience, sight comes after faith. So God is saying when you walk by faith, what happens is you begin to see what God is trying to show you. When you walk by faith, then it's revealed to you in the natural what God was trying, what, what God is showing you. It manifests. You see it in the spiritual realm first, is what God is saying. Then it manifests in the natural when you walk by faith. Um, another simple example. So if you're struggling with doubt, what should we do? Good question. Then, if I'm it, now, that's a very good question. Let, let me let, let me uh, approach it this way. Whatever situation you're in that's causing you to doubt, okay, I'm in a situation, and right now I'm doubting that I'm gonna come out. Say you went to the doctors and you received a bad report from the doctor. So now I received this bad report from the doctor. And now I'm just, I'm doubting. I'm doubting God. I don't know if I'm going to make it, whatever the case may be. So what has to happen with that situation? Very good question. What, I, what has to happen is, is am I going to believe, whose report am I going to believe? Okay, watch this. Am I going to believe the doctor's report, which is going to increase my doubt? Or am I going to believe God's report? The only way I can see God's report is that now I said, I'm going to have to say, Lord, here's my situation, but I know your word says this. So then if your word says this, then I know you can bring me out of this situation that I'm doubting. But if I don't trust God and I just take what information that I have, then what happens is my doubt is going to increase to the point where I'm not trusting God. I'm not trusting his word. I'm not even able to receive a word because I'm in doubt. Okay. All right. So how we tackle doubt is what does God's word say? Doubt is saying you're not going to make it. Doubt is saying you're going to be stuck here. God's word says, no, I delivered you from that. God's word says, I died for that sickness. God's word says, I'm going to bring you out of this. So whose report you're going to believe? You're going to believe the doctor and the doubt that has now been, uh, I don't want to necessarily say planted, but that would probably be a good analogy. Now it's been planted into you. Or you're going to allow God's word to uproot the doubt, okay, and say, no, God, your word stands true, okay? Always bring your situation. It's almost like, Lord, I'm bringing doubt to you. Here's my situation. Lord, I'm doubting the outcome of this. So Lord, because you know better than I do, you're much wiser than I am, I'm bringing my doubtful situation to you. What does your word say about my doubtful situation? Watch this. The Bible says, with God, all things are possible. So it does not matter how doubtful this situation is. God's word says, um, with God, all things are possible. So now that erases the doubt. That means I don't care about what my doctor just said. I don't care about what my job just said. God says with him, 
my situation, there's a possibility that something greater is going to come out of this situation. So sometimes we have to get the Holy Ghost boldness and begin to speak to our situations with this faith that we have in God and his word. But I've told you that on Sunday, the reason why the believer struggles is because we don't have enough word in our heart. Because more word that we have in our heart is more word that comes forth. Okay? This dispels doubt, fear. The more words you get into your heart, the more word that comes forth. When the Bible talks about it's living water, springs of living water flowing out of you, the more words you get into your, in your heart, the more it's going to flow out. Okay? That's how, you, that's how you tackle your situations. Okay? You guys said, listen, I understand what you're saying, Doc, but guess what? Listen, the God that I serve, his word tells me different. Do you understand? I feel the power of God when I said that. Do you understand that when you get a diagnosis and you and you quote the word of God over your diagnosis and saying, listen, I understand this is my diagnosis. I understand this is my predicament. But God's word says this, that it cancels out your, your, your situation. Your situation no longer exists because nothing is greater than the word of God. So now when you quote the word of God by faith, now your situation becomes subject to God and your situation no longer has the power and authority that it has. All you have to do is keep walking and believing by faith. That's it. You got to keep declaring that thing. No, God, your word says this. You got to keep declaring God's word by faith every day over your situation. And guess what? Your situation will no longer exist, even psychologically. Because you quoted the word of God. I told you the word of God cancels that stuff. When somebody uh, prophesies something over you and you know this is not of God, listen, you don't have you can rebuke that thing. You don't have to accept that. And the word of God will cancel that thing out. But you got to get the word in your heart. That's where the transformation. We just can't have it here. Because if we have it here, we're going through motions. When you just get the word of God here and you just believe it here and you obtain it here, you're just going through the motions. You like the, you like, you like the Pharisees and Sadducees. You're just going through the motions. They knew how to pray and put on sackcloths and sit in ashes. They knew how to do all that kind of stuff. They knew how to put on a show. And so when you process the word of God here only, you're just putting on a show. You're just going through the motions. Okay? And God doesn't want us to go through the motions. Give me about 10 more minutes and we'll be done. Page 87. Page 87. Hope you're getting something. It says, David says, I would have, watched this, lost heart. I would have fainted. I would have given up unless I have believed. Okay? Remember, believe deals with, let me go back to make sure I got the, deals with change in motion. He said, unless I believed, unless I had faith. That I would, what, see the goodness. So by faith, here is, here is David now. He says, in the natural, I would have given up unless I believed, unless I had faith that I would, by faith, see the goodness. So then what he's basically saying is, listen, whatever I was experiencing, I would have fainted if I didn't have faith. So that's why we got to keep the faith. That's why we got to keep trusting God because when we don't trust God, we set ourselves up to faint. We set ourselves up to give up. And then watch this. He said that I will see. The only way you can see the goodness of God in a bad situation, you got to walk by faith. To the natural man, it does not make sense. You just got fired um, from your job, but you can still see the goodness of the Lord. And they said, how in God's great earth are you still giving God praise and you just got fired? How in the world um, um, and, and you, you lost a close loved one, but you still magnifying God? Is why? Because faith tells me that I can still see the goodness of the Lord, even though I just came out of or I just experienced a bad situation. I can still see by faith the goodness of God. Or the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, David says, Psalms 27 and 13. Okay? So that's what I told you. Faith sees, faith speaks, faith hears. Okay? 
Faith sees beyond what you're hearing. All right? Let's drop down page 87. We're going to drop down one under the scripture of John, the 11th chapter, 39 through 40. And I'm just dealing with Lazarus, Lazarus in the tomb. Excuse me. Watch this. Page 87. Here Jesus makes it plain that faith consists in believing first and then seeing, not the other way around. Faith consists in, in I have to believe God first. Then when I'm believing God first for, I'll see. Excuse me. Most carnal, carnally minded people reverse the order. They say, I only believe in what I see. We've heard that plenty of times. Man, I don't, you know, I don't believe in all that faith stuff, man. You know, I, I got to see it to believe it. We, it's like doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, like, man, look, I, I'm not going to believe Jesus resurrected until I see his hand, until I put my hand in his side. You just got some folk like that. That's just where they at in the faith. They don't, they, they, they're they not going to believe they're, they're that carnal. John was just that carnal. Not John. Um, but he was that carnal. That he said, I'm not going to believe. Doubting Thomas. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I'm able to put my hand in his side. You just That's just where some people are at. Okay? But this is incorrect. When we can actually see a thing, we do not need to exercise faith. So faith is something that I know exists, but I don't see it. I It doesn't exist. It, it, it exists, but I don't see it. I'm believing God for something that has not manifested or existed actually yet, but it's coming. Okay? That's what faith is. Even though I don't see it, what I'm believing God for is invisible, but I know it's there. Otherwise, in other words, I know it's there, but it just has not manifested yet. I believe God, even though I cannot see it, I know it's there, but it just have not manifested, have not came to life yet. It's breathing and living, but I can't see it in, with, with my natural eyes, okay? I, I use that analogy of Abraham, and the Lord said he would be a father of many nations. And he told him to look at the sand, and so by faith, Abraham saw him being the father of many nations. He saw it by faith even though it did not materialize. He didn't live long enough to, to see the material. Now, the, the promised son Isaac did come to pass because he was old in age and the Lord promised him a son. He said he'd be a father of many nations, but he promised him a son. Son did come to pass because him and his wife was in old age, okay? So the Lord stepped in. That's something miraculous that the Lord has done, okay? But him being the father of many nations, even after Isaac, okay, he saw it by faith, he just didn't see it materialize. Okay? God, God may, may speak something and say, you know, um, generations after us, you know, your generation after you is going to be blessed. Now, you may, not, you may not be living to see it, but in the spirit, God will show you by faith that what I'm showing you is real, but you may not live long enough to see it. But God will show you by faith so you know it's real and you know it exists. You just don't, you just don't live long enough to see the manifestations or, or, or the birth of it. Okay? So faith is this. I can't, faith is saying, I don't see it, but I know it's there. That's what God is saying. That's what faith is. Okay? Faith is believing that God, I know it's there, but I can't see it. But I know it's there because you show me in the spirit that is there because I believe by faith. I told you, faith is the vision for the believer. The only way you can see Jesus, the only way you can see God, it's by faith. God reveals himself to you by faith. That's why our testimony is so strong and so powerful because God is revealing to himself to us by faith. He's revealing his word to us 
by faith. And so the more that he reveals to us by faith, our testimony grows. It becomes much stronger. It becomes much bolder because God is saying, I'm revealing myself to you because you're believing something. Um, and, and I always talk about John 17 chapter. Jesus says, I'm even praying for those who never seen me, but yet believe. We ain't never seen Jesus, but by faith, we believe he exists. And so what Jesus does, because by faith, we believe that he exists, even though we didn't walk with him or talk with him, he will manifest, he will show himself, not just through his word, but he will show us to himself through visions and dreams. Okay? That's how God operates when you walk by faith. Okay? Let me finish up. We're on page 87. Um, let's look at the next paragraph. It says, quite often... In our experience, we find an apparent conf conflict between the evidence of our senses, smell, eyes, hearing, all that kind of stuff, and the revelation of God's word. So we're, we're, there's a battle going on with our senses and what God's word says. If I look at my credit, my physical sense tells me I don't qualify. If I look at my credit report, it would say, I don't qualify. But God is saying, if you trust me, I'm going to do something greater than what you're seeing. So we cannot get caught up in, as a believer, in what we see. David said it best. He said, my foot on Mose slipped because I kept looking at the wicked and their prosperity because he was looking at their prosperity from a natural perspective. But glory to God when he said, when I got to the house of the Lord, he began to look at his situation. He said, man, I was almost, I was about to slip. I was about to backslide. I was about to go back to what I used to do. But he says, when I got to the house of God, I saw their end, that what they were in, that their end is destruction. God is, what, what David was saying is like, I, I no longer got caught up in what I was physically seeing no more because I realized they're in, eternally, they're going to be in hell. He realized their, their ending was going to be destruction and that there is no better place to be but in the house of God or in his presence. Because we are the house of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So even though I can't be here, I can experience, I can still experience God and be in his presence. Okay? But watch this. And I'm going to be done. I know it's 636. Give me a few more minutes. I'm going to be done. Here we go. So quite often in, in our experience, we find an apparent conflict, conflict between the evidence of our senses and the revelation of God's word. For instance, we may see and feel within our bodies all of the evidence of physical sickness. This is what I was talking about earlier. Yet the Bible reveals that Jesus himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, Matthew 8 and 17. Or by whose stripes you are healed, by his stripes, 1 Peter 2 and 24. So in other words, even though I'm experiencing sickness in my body, the word of God says that Jesus, by his stripes, I'm healed. Or he had bore my infirmities, my sicknesses, my diseases. He bore these things. He took on these things. In other words, it's saying this. We must recognize, this is the bold print on page 87. We must recognize that the mere mental acceptance of the Bible's statement concerning healing and health lacks the power to make them real in our physical experience. Okay? We must recognize that their mental acceptance, remember I told you that, you heard what the doctor said, you process it mentally, doubt, fear entered in, watch, you got to watch that, of the Bible statement, just, just processing the word of God, what it says here, not allowing it to get here, it says the Bible statement concerning healing and, and lack, and healing and health lacks the power to make them real in our life physical experience. So when you just process the word of God here and don't ever process it here, then guess what? What you are processing here 
ain't going to come to fruition until you believe it here. Last thing. This is here in apparent conflict. Our senses tell us we are sick. Our, our, our senses tell us by what we see, we in debt. The Bible tells us we're healed. So what has to happen is, even though I am sick, the Bible says I'm healed. Whose report am I going to believe? Am I going to believe my senses and what I'm feeling? Or am I going to believe God's word? You got to make this choice. This conflict between the testimony of our senses and the testimony of God's word confronts us as believers with the possibility of two alternative reactions. Page 88. On the other hand, we must accept the testimony of our senses, thus accept our physical sickness. In other words, if you accept the testimony of, your, of, of what, you, what your senses are saying, then you're going to be stuck. You're going to be exactly what you are accepting. In this way, we become slaves of our carnal mind. Okay, that's why we don't want to be carnal minded. We don't want to press things, we don't want to process things carnally or fleshly. On the other hand, we may hold firmly to the testimony of God's word that we are healed. So you have the option. We're going to stop there. Page 88. We're going to start with the next paragraph if we do this with genuine active faith. We're going to, that's where we're going to pick up next week. Page 88 where it says, if we do this with genuine active faith. That's where we're going to pick up at. Okay? Page 88, second paragraph. So now, I'm going to leave you with whose report you're going to believe. Whose report? Are you going to trust God? Or are you going to trust what you feel and what you think? How many times have we trusted our own personal instinct rather than the discerning of the Holy Spirit? And we got jacked up or we messed ourselves up because we just we was carnal about it rather than being spiritual about it. Okay? No, we process things spiritually first, then natural. Okay? We process things of what is God saying, and then Lord show me in the natural. Okay. So I thank God for you, all those who watch live on tonight. Listen, um, uh, this Sunday, as we know, we're in Passover week. Passover officially uh, starts tomorrow. I put a post on, on Facebook about um, that Jesus um, was slain on Wednesday. I'm going to get into this real quick and then I'm going to get off. I, wanna, I, I, want, I want to, you can read John, um, I think it's the 19th chapter. Um, but I've been wrestling with this for years. Because they always said Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights, all this kind of thing. And when I when, when I studied last night, um, the Jewish the, the Passover, this is where we're in Passover um, season. When I studied it, the sacrificial lamb, watch this, was slain on Wednesday. Okay, watch this, Christ. Now, this is what they did yearly, the sacrificial lamb. Yearly, they, they sacrificed that lamb. It was on Wednesday. Christ, as I'm studying, died on Wednesday. Okay, they took, they, they couldn't allow him to stay on the cross. They took him down because the Passover feast uh, was after sundown. Now, the Jewish culture, and I know this may take a little bit long, but I'm, I'm just going to, I may get into it later. The Jewish culture or the Eastern culture, whenever after sundown, it was a new day. Like say, for example, our sundown is seven o'clock. After sundown, it's now Thursday. This is, you got to understand Eastern culture. So Jesus died on Wednesday. They took him down because they couldn't keep him up during the Passover. They took him down. So what happens is this is what they did with the, the actual lamb because they had the... Um, the, the 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 dinner, and I, I don't have all my terminology together right now, um, but they had the dinner after sundown, which is Thursday. Okay. What I'm what I'm trying to get to you is it didn't he didn't die on Friday and then Saturday. No, according to the custom and the culture, the sacrificial lamb, and I want you to study this for yourself because this is something 
that I was, you know, being raised up in church. You just accept, he, you know, he died Friday. He was in the grave Friday night and, and Saturday and, and then early Sunday morning. No, nah, he was slain on Wednesday, okay, because it was according to the custom. They process his body Thursday for us after sundown, which would have been Friday, okay? Look at this process. They had, they had their Passover meal. There it is. After sundown, Wednesday, which is Thursday, they processed or they prepared Jesus' body after sundown Thursday, which is now Friday. Okay? I want you to study this. This is, some, this is good information. I know it's extra information I should be getting off, but it's good information because of what we were taught was that it was Friday, Saturday, and then early Sunday. And even when I went to Bible college, they said a part of a day was considered a whole day. So Jesus was in the grave part of the day, Friday. And he was in the grave part of the day, Saturday, okay, or the whole day, Saturday. And then he rose up early the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So he was, even though it was early um, in the day, they still process it as part of the day. Okay, that's what I kind of learned in Bible college. Okay, but well now I'm understanding that Christ, Jesus was slain, he was sacrificed, he died on Wednesday. They processed his body Thursday, but after sundown, so now that makes it Friday. I know this is a lot. And then he was in the grave. And you, you, you'll find this in um, John, the 19th chapter. Um, start reading verses 31 through 42, something around there. You'll see this. Wanted to give you that little extra nugget to study. And that's the reason why we're doing this discipleship class, because there's just some things that we were taught over the years. And I'm like, all these years. Now, I never preach Friday, Saturday, Sunday type thing. But all these years, I, that's what was here. Okay? That's how I process it here. But then, as I did my own studying, I'm finding out that Jesus didn't die Friday night. He died Wednesday. Okay? The Passover meal was that evening after sundown, which now is considered Thursday, okay? So do your own research on it. I gave you um, John, I think it's the 19th chapter. You can read 31 through, I think, 40-something. That would give you, and, and Google this stuff. Do your study and do your research, okay? I've been doing my own research because I want to properly teach this so it can be effective. Listen, I'm going to pray this out. Thank you for your time, this extra 10 minutes that you gave me to, to give that little nugget. I pray that it's helped you understand uh, a little bit more about our Savior. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for teaching on tonight, Lord God, using me as a vessel. We, Lord God, we thank you for the questions that was asked on tonight. We pray, Father God, that everything that was taught on tonight was in context of Scripture. Nothing was exaggerated. Nothing was watered down. Nothing was said that was, was contrary to your word, Father God. And if so, if anything that was said was not properly taught correctly, anything that was, was not properly interpreted correctly, Father God, forgive me right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for anything that I have not taught correctly or processed correctly in the context of Scripture, Father God, for you have used me as a vessel, vessel not to deceive your children, Lord God, but to build them up in the faith through your word, Father God. So I pray that this word that was taught on tonight through you, Father God, that will be received on good ground, Father God, that their hearts are not hardened, but is received on good ground. Any things we ask in Jesus' name, everybody say amen. God bless you. Have a blessed night. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I will share the giving link. This is not for Standing God Ministries. It's for those who may see the video, they may want to give. I thank you um, for your giving and your faithfulness, however you gave this past time, as the Lord leads, continue to give that way if it works for you. But when I share the link, it has nothing to do with you giving on tonight or, or even on Sunday. We're in a whole different process. So I want to make that clear on that, okay? Um, love you all. Appreciate your faithfulness to God. Have a good night. And I will see you Sunday, which is not Easter Sunday, okay? It's Resurrection Sunday. Get that in your spirit. We got to stop saying Easter. Easter is a pagan holiday. I know Easter is in the Bible. And, and even though Easter is in the Bible and they try to say it, it refers to the Passover. Easter and Passover is two different things.
Okay? That's why you got to study the Word of God. Okay? Easter and Passover is two different things. It's Resurrection Sunday, not Easter Sunday. And as, as Pastor Casper say, you know, uh, Easter Bunny don't lay eggs. I'm going to leave that right there. I'm going to leave that right there. Easter Bunny don't lay eggs. So the whole theory of coloring eggs and all that kind of stuff, hope I didn't bust, burst somebody's bubble. But God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Have an awesome night.